Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure to stand before you again this morning. Um, today, the sermon is entitled, The Magnificence of the Child Who Was God. So you can turn with me so long to Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20. We will get to that in a second. Now, Christmas ought to be one of the most joyous celebrations in a Christian household. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, so that those who believe in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. It all begins with God who sent His Son, the incarnation of our Lord Jesus. Now that is something that we should celebrate every day. In Revelation 5, John has an amazing experience in the very throne room of God, and he sees God seated on a throne, and God holds in his hand a scroll. And this scroll represents the title deed of the entire universe. And at present, we know that Satan is the God of this world. So, God is seen in this picture of Revelation 5 holding this title deed, and then he asks, who is worthy to take the scroll from his hand? Who is worthy to open this title deed? And as John looks around, in all heaven and earth, no one is found suitable to open this title deed. And John starts weeping. But then, in his midst, he beholds one who is both a lamb and a lion, none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, who steps up and takes the scroll from the hand of the Father. He alone is worthy to open that scroll. If there is any person that we could ever celebrate, it is our Lord Jesus. And the reality of Christ is especially profound when we consider how he took on the form of lowly man in order to reconcile us to himself, to transfer us from the domain of darkness into his glorious kingdom of light. Our Lord Jesus did not become great. He has always been the greatest of all time. In Matthew 2, we read the account of Jesus' birth and how the wise men saw the star and how they followed it to the birthplace of Jesus. And I'll read a, a portion of Matthew 2 for, for you. It reads, And going into the house, they, this is the wise men, saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Now, why did the wise men fall down and worship Jesus? Because he was the living God incarnate. He was the king of the universe, the ruler over all, the long-awaited Messiah, the savior of the universe. Lying in that manger was the God of all creation. What a marvelous and incomprehensible thought. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, In him the whole fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form. And as a baby in that manger, Jesus was fully man, but he was fully God. That the king of the universe should take on the form of lowly man. Two weeks ago, William spoke about uh, service, Christian service, and last week, Tokuzani spoke about love. And the very Jesus who lay in that manger is the one who taught us how to love and how to serve. Now the lowly stable in which our Lord was born and the swaddling cloths in which he was wrapped was never meant to be a quiet facade to hide the fact that he was God. But rather, it was a powerful demonstration of humility and servanthood. Now this sermon aims to elucidate the magnificence of our Lord's birth. The question this sermon aims to answer is, why can we say that the birth of Christ is indeed magnificent? Now the short answer is exactly what I alluded to now. The fact that the baby who lay in that manger was not just any old baby. It was the God of the universe. Now that is truly phenomenal. Now the sermon will unpack some of the infinite number of reasons why Christ's incarnation is indeed magnificent. Now, I would be able to carry on for days if I had to give you all the reasons, but for now, 
For the purposes of time, we will just focus on Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20, which I believe concisely sets out the magnificence of Christ's incarnation. So we will be working through this portion of Scripture, Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20, um, verse by verse. So I urge you to follow along in your Bible. For the purposes of time, we won't be able to page around a lot, so I urge you to stay in Colossians, and I will quote any other verses outside of Colossians, but I will give you the references for those of you who would like to take note. Let's read Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20 together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The purpose of this sermon is to evoke awe and wonder for our Lord Jesus. So throughout the sermon, I want you to consider how magnificent Christ's incarnation is, and also how the baby who lay in that manger was fully God, and that he upheld the universe by the, word of his, by the power of his word. Before we start, let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we have the privilege this morning, Lord, to look at your word, Lord, and Lord, to celebrate Christmas. Lord, it is a joyous occasion, Lord. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. Lord, your rule and reign we will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Lord, I pray that you will guide us in wisdom and in knowledge as we work through your scripture this morning. I pray that you will convict us concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And Lord, I pray that your name will be magnified through this sermon. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so now let's look at Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20 together. Okay, we're going to use Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20 to motivate exactly why Christ's incarnation is magnificent. Okay, so let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 reads... We're first just going to look at the first part of verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. So the first truth, the first reason why Christ's incarnation is magnificent is the fact that he is God. The part of the text that we are studying conveys the most significant and profound truth about our Lord Jesus. And I would argue that this is the pinnacle of the magnificence of his birth. The very, this verse clearly states that Christ is the very image, the exact imprint of God. This is precisely the reason why Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 7 verse 14, and I quote, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as we heard earlier, means God with us. And in Matthew 1 verse 23, we see that Jesus is the Emmanuel which was prophesied in Isaiah 7 verse 14. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He was literally God with us. He dwelt with lowly man in this very world. There are number, quite a number of other references in Scripture which convey the same truth. So, I'll quote it for you. Hebrews 1 verse 3 reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So, Jesus Christ is the shining forth of God's glory and he is his exact imprint. Now, because of the fact that Jesus was the exact imprint of God, Jesus was able to say in John 13, 14 verse 9, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And that is because Jesus and the Father are one, as we also see in John 10 verse 30, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. 
So if you have seen Christ, you have indeed seen the Father. And this just again confirms the deity of Christ. Colossians 2 verse 9. Since you are in Colossians, you can turn with me to Colossians 2 verse 9. It reads, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Notice how Paul says that the whole fullness of God dwelt in Christ. I like how Paul adds whole before full because it's almost redundant. Both of these words refer to a totality or a completeness. Whole fullness. And this apparent redundancy emphasizes that the fact that the totality and the completeness of God dwelt in Christ. So when Jesus was laying in that manger, he was God incarnate. The God of the universe in his fullness, in his totality, lay in that manger. Now that is truly magnificent. In verse 19 of the text that we are studying, so that's chapter 1 verse 19, we see Paul quoting a similar, or using a similar expression. Um, So I'm skipping ahead to verse 19 now, which reads, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So here again, Paul uses all of the fullness, again, emphatic and redundant verbiage, to show that the fullness of God dwelt in Christ. And here he adds that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. He alone was worthy. So Jesus, even as a baby in that stable, was the very image of God. All of God's deity dwelt in him bodily. He was 100% human, yet 100% God. And what a marvelous and magnificent truth that is. This raises our Lord's humility to a next level. Because although he was God, although he was equal with God, he did not count that equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself and took on the form of a humble servant, of a slave. Now, we're still in verse 15. We look at the first part, which read, he is the image of the invisible God. Now, let's look at the second part, which reads, the firstborn of all creation. Now, this portion of the verse is often misinterpreted to suggest that Jesus was the first created being. And this is especially adopted by Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Christ has been made by God and that he is somehow, um, that he has somehow less deity than God the Father. But this is not at all what Paul is saying when he says that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. The Greek word for firstborn is prototokos, which is derived from the word protos, meaning first, and technon, meaning child. So, literally translated, Paul is saying that Christ is the first child. Now, the term firstborn is used in two ways in Scripture. Either literally, meaning the firstborn child, and I can give you an example of this in Luke 2 verse 7, and I quote, We read, and she, this is Mary, gave birth to her firstborn, her prototokos son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths as he laid in the manger. So we know that Mary's firstborn, that uh, that Jesus was Mary's firstborn son because she was a virgin when she conceived our Lord Jesus. So we know that there are no other children before Christ. So here it was meant literally. But then, prototokos, or firstborn, is most often in the New Testament used figuratively. And let me give you an example. In Colossians 1, verse 18, so the text that we are studying, you can just have a look at verse 18 now, we read, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, prototokos, from the dead. He is the firstborn from the dead. Now, you cannot possibly infer that this is referring to the fact that Christ is the firstborn baby or the firstborn um, from the dead because it doesn't fit in the context. It is very clear that this is meant figuratively. So now you might wonder, where does this figurative expression of firstborn come from? So, in both Greek and Jewish culture, the firstborn son was the heir of the father's inheritance. And we see this in Deuteronomy 21 verse 17. Where it is established that the firstborn son receives a double portion of the father's inheritance. So, 
um, the firstborn was thus, thus ranked number one in the family in terms of the inheritance. In our text, when Paul says to the Colossians that Christ is the firstborn of all creation, he does not mean literally that Jesus was the first created being, but rather uses it figuratively to convey the fact that Jesus is preeminent, that he is first in rank. So to rephrase Paul's words, Paul says he is the first ranked and heir of all creation. So Paul had the rights and privileges of a firstborn son in mind when he wrote this. And Paul's statement is similar to what we read elsewhere in Scripture. So just to give you an example, in Exodus 4 verse 22 we, we read, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And then also of David we read in Psalm 89 verse 27, And I will make him, this is David, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So as Israel was first ranked in terms of favor with God, so also David was first ranked amongst the kings of the earth. And so also Christ is the firstborn, the number one ranked of all creation. And we can conclude this meaning with confidence, because the literal meaning of firstborn does not make sense in this context. And I'll just quickly explain why I say that. Jesus cannot be the only begotten Son of God, and the firstborn son of God at the same time. And why do I say that? Because firstborn implies that there are more children. Grammatically, it doesn't make sense to say that someone is firstborn when they are the only born. So that's just a grammatical reason why this does not make sense. Secondly, and this is the most damning reason, is, and we see in verse 16, Jesus is the creator of the universe. How can he be the creator and the created at the same time? That simply does not make sense. That is paradoxical. So that would make verse 16 a blatant lie if one had to infer that in verse 15, firstborn means that Christ was created. So Paul most definitely has the figurative meaning of firstborn son in mind when he says that he is the firstborn of all creation. When our Lord was laying in the manger, he was the firstborn. He was number one in rank. He was the heir of all creation. Now, let's look at verse 16. Verse 16, we read. I'm going to split verse 16 into two parts. Let's read verse 16 together. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So we'll first focus on the fact that Christ is creator. All right? So we'll look at the thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities separately after this. But he is the creator of the universe. Now this very clearly conveys Christ's involvement in creation. He is unambiguously described as the creator of all things. This verse very clearly says that all things were created by him, for him, and through him. The very angels who were singing glory to God in the highest, as we read in Luke 2 verse 13, on the night of Jesus' birth, were created by our Lord, who lay in that manger. Jesus' very parents were created by him, through him, and for him. The star which served as a sign for the wise men was created by him, through him, and for him. The wise men who fell down and worshipped him were created by him, through him, and for him. King Herod, who wanted to kill this newborn king of the Jews, was created by him, through him, and for him. And the very body into which our Lord was born was created by him, through him, and for him. In John 1 verse 3 we read, All things were made through him. This is referring to Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. So once again, this is an unambiguous statement indicating that our Lord was involved in creation, that he is the creator of all things. So the baby who lay in that lowly manger in Bethlehem was the creator of all things. The creator was born into his own creation. 
Now that, again, is truly magnificent. Now, still in verse 16, I didn't speak about the thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities now. So let's have a look at that portion of the verse. So just to recap, it reads, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So this is referring to the fact that all thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities were created by our Lord. So here we clearly see that all things were created by our Lord, including authority, rulers, dominions. And this implies, and this is the fourth reason why Christ's incarnation is magnificent, That he is the ruler of all things. That he is the ultimate authority given. Now why do I say that? Because someone cannot make authority if they do not have authority. So for example, an employee in a workplace cannot simply decide that they are going to appoint themselves the CEO of the company. And just as I can't stand before you today and appoint myself the president, it's because I do not have the authority to do so. You need to have authority in order to make or delegate authority. So when we read here that all things were created by him, including dominions and rulers and thrones and authorities, we know that Christ is the ultimate authority giver. Now there are other portions of scripture which convey the same meaning. In Colossians 2 verse 9 we read about Christ that he is the head of all rule and authority. In Matthew 28, verse 18, we read that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Christ speaking here, that all authority has been given to him. So when Jesus was laying in that manger, he was and still is the ruler over all and the ultimate authority giver. And that, again, is truly magnificent. Now let's move over to verse 17. Verse 17 reads, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. So we just looked at the fact now that our Lord was the creator of the universe, that he was involved in creation. Now we read that he is the sustainer of his creation as well, because in him all things hold together. And there are other verses in the New Testament which convey the same truth. So let's, um, I'll quote Hebrews 1 verse 3 for you. It reads, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And in Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6, we read, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist through whom we exist. So the universe and everything in it is constantly being sustained by the powerfully effective word of the sun. The planets are kept in orbit by him. Plants grow because he gives it the energy to grow. Ecosystems are maintained by him. Babies are conceived because he allows it to happen. People, animals, and plants are all kept alive because he enables it. Every bit of energy in the universe originates from him. I cannot even lift up my right hand now or speak without the Lord empowering me, giving me the ability and the energy to do so. The earth orbits at an angle of 23 degrees. If the earth's orientation had to change just slightly, it would affect our seasons, our precipitation, ultimately the growth of food, And finally, life. And if the earth had to move further away from the sun, the earth would freeze, making life unviable. And if the earth had to move closer to the sun, the earth would melt. So our Lord upholds the universe, preventing it from falling into utter chaos and from disintegrating. So our Lord created the universe and he also sustains the universe. Now the very verse quoted from 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6, which I, which I quoted just now, I'll just remind you, it reads, through whom are all things and through whom we exist, conveys the idea that Christ is our very sustenance. He's our energy. He's the enabler of our existence. So think of a battery-operated toy. 
that toy cannot serve its purpose unless it has a battery. Now, similarly, we are in a figurative sense, the toy, and, and our Lord Jesus is the battery which energizes us and enables us to serve the very purpose which He has sovereignly ordained. But our Lord is not only the creator and the sustainer, He is also the consummator of all things. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. So, for example, in Proverbs 21, verse 1, we read the following, and I'll quote, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The Lord guides the decisions of kings, rulers, and all of those in authority. And absolutely nothing in the world can transpire without the Lord's consent. No decision can be made without the Lord's approval. So we can know that Jesus' crucifixion was not an accident at all. It was plan A from the beginning of creation. As our dear Lord was laying in that manger, He was still upholding the universe, sustaining it and working all things according to the counsel of His will. That is almost incomprehensible. Now let's read verse 18. Verse 18, we read, and he is the head of the body, the church. So similar to Corinthians 12, Paul uses the human body as a metaphor for the church. So just like our natural bodies need a brain or a head to control, direct, and ultimately give life to the body, so also Jesus is the head, which controls, directs, and gives life to his church. And Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now this verse conveys the same truth. The head of the body is also the chief or the authority of the body because it gives life, because it sustains it and directs it and enables it. So the baby who lay in the manger was and still is the head of the church. He controls, directs and gives life to all of those who are in him. Again, we see how the holy child who lay in that stable was not just any child. He was the chief, the head of his full known and predestined children, the church. Verse 19 we looked at earlier. Verse 20, let's read verse 20 together. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now there's enough here to do a whole sermon on, so I'll just do a very brief overview of this section. And a lot has already been said about Christ being our reconciler and peacemaker. Um, As Leon mentioned earlier, Jesus' name is very apt. Jesus literally means Savior, and Christ means Messiah. So Jesus Christ literally means the Messiah, the Christ who saves. Now he reconciled us to himself through his propitiatory death and has established peace between us and God. Before Christ's marvelous work on the cross, we were at enmity with God. We were caught up in our transgressions with no means of escape. Our destiny was certain death, a righteous punishment for our transgression against God. We were caught up in our transgressions And we were unable to keep God's righteous commandments. And we have fallen far, far short from His righteousness. Even our absolute best behavior falls very far short from His holiness and righteousness. It is impossible for us not to sin. We were all destined for wrath. But by the grace of our Lord, we have been reconciled to Him and we are at peace with Him. So, um, let's just first look at the fact that Christ is reconciler. So, the first part of verse 20 reads, And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Now, through Christ, the Father reconciled all things to himself. Now, this does not mean, I just want to give a footnote, all things does not mean every single human being that has ever lived is saved or has been predestined for salvation by God. But rather, the idea here is that all things have been reconciled to Him in the sense that those who are in Christ have been reconciled to Him. We are no longer at enmity with Him. 
and all the rest who are not in Christ will be submissive to him. They will submit to him on the day of judgment. And in that way, all things are reconciled. So Christ lived the life that we could not and bore the penalty of death which we rightfully deserved. And that is precisely how we were reconciled to God. In the very next verse, verse 21, we see a bit of an elaboration of this reconciliation that Paul alludes to in verse 20. So verse 21 reads, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith. So, so when our Lord reconciled us, it, was, it wasn't just for no purpose. He reconciled us in the sense that we are no longer at enmity with him so that we may be holy, blameless, and above reproach as long as we continue in the faith. And let's look at the second part of verse 20. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Now what peace is this referring to? This is not yet referring to the peace which Leon alluded to earlier when he mentioned the peace that will be on earth and the lack of um, affliction. But this is the peace in the sense that um, we know that we are at peace with God. We are no longer at enmity with God. He did this so that his righteousness could be imputed for us so that we could be deemed righteous. Before the Father. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 reads, For our sake he made him, that's Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And because of our Lord's propitiatory death for us, we know in, from Romans 8 verse 1 that therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when the Father looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness. We are therefore at peace with the Father because of the work of Christ. Romans 5 verse 1 reads, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of our peace with God through our Lord Jesus, we are also able to have peace in our hearts, knowing, knowing that we are no longer at enmity with the Most High God. And this is precisely why the angels were singing on the evening of Christ's birth. And I quote from Luke 2 verse 13, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace, uh, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We have peace in him, knowing that we are no longer at enmity with him, knowing that our salvation in him is secure. We have a sure hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. The baby who lay in that manger and later bore the penalty for our sins, our past, present, and future sins. So in conclusion, the Lamb who took away the sins of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, humbly took on the form of man and lay in that lowly manger. The child born in that stable was the firstborn of all creation. He was God, the creator, sustainer, consummator of the universe, the ruler over all, the head of the church, reconciler and peacemaker. That is truly magnificent. It is worthy of our awe and worship. So as we celebrate Christmas today and tomorrow, let us meditate on the absolute magnificence of our Lord's birth and His incomparable humility. Let us not be led astray or be consumed by the world celebration of Christmas, because Christmas is not about gifts or get-togethers or food. Christmas is about Christ. Let's be consumed with awe and wonder for our Lord. So as we spend time with our loved ones and as we eat and drink, let us magnify him in our celebration of Christmas. Thank you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we can know that we are at peace with you because of what you have done for us, our Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the awe and wonder that we can have knowing, Lord, that, Lord, while you were laying in that manger, you were God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, and ultimately our peacemaker, 
our reconciler. Lord, we give glory to you. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to honor you in our hearts and not to set our mind on the things of this world. And Lord, as we celebrate Christmas, Lord, that we will honor you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.